May I have your attention, please? You have just passed your first test. You might not have known you were taking a test, but you did. We gave you a quiet signal, and you were quiet within about five seconds. That's one of the things we know should happen, whether your group is five people or 500 people. I believe we are somewhere between 250 and 300 today, so you passed your first test. Welcome. We are so glad to see you today. We've been looking forward to this. We've been planning and getting ready for you. We have the honor of being your teachers for this session. This session in which we will learn about the instructional protocol for Wichita Public Schools. Um, new to some of you, not new to others of you, but we want to be sure we give you everything you need so that we can all speak the same language and start at the same place with regard to instruction given its importance. And so, we are glad to add our voices to those welcoming you. Um, I'm Lisa Stinson. I work for the Department of Curriculum and Instructional Support as an MTSS specialist. And I am joined by the partner of my dreams today. Good morning, my name is Gina Shute. I am also with Lisa as an MTSS specialist. And we are, as she said, super excited to have you all and welcome you all to the district. You have content and literacy objectives in your teaching. And so we have content and literacy objectives in our teaching for you today. And here they are. Uh, with regard to content today, it's really gonna be important that you learn the expectations of the negotiated agreement with regard to lesson planning and instruction. And um, we want you to learn the components of the lesson plan that uh, are important for you to know. And we also want you to be introduced to the elements on the Marzano map that connect to our work with instruction. That puts you in a good place. You will see this instructional protocol time and time again, all year. You will learn about it all year, and next year, and the next year, because it is just a learning thing. So, with regard to literacy objectives, that's the how, you're going to listen and respond by participating in collaborative conversations. You are going to write some content and literacy objectives, and you will read about some lesson plan components. So, that's where we're going in the next hour and a few minutes or so. And so, um, we use CHAMPS in our district um, to respectfully set expectations, knowing that when, when those things are met, that is the how we're gonna get this work done. How are we gonna do this in this time, in this space, well, we're going to do that by considering expectations for conversation. We ask for um, the, 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 the professional demeanor of a voice level zero when a speaker is talking. That's a good rule here. That's a good rule in your staff meetings. That's a good rule in other professional learning situations in which you will find yourself. And that just is a respectful thing. Um, when you are working with a partner, and you will, uh, feel free to be at voice level one, which is a little louder than a whisper probably, um, but voice level two when you're speaking to people at your table. That's of course then a little bit louder than that. Voice level zero is no talking if I didn't mention that, just so you know. Um, what do you do if you need some help? Well, we will use an attention signal, which you've already learned, to make the best use of our time and um, help the group to refocus. And if there's something else that you need help with, feel free to quietly ask someone near you or raise your hand. And one of our support people will rush right to you and get you what you need. What will the activity look like today? Well, our activity is working with the, one of the USD 259 key requirements, which is about instruction. That's our activity today. For movement, we ask that you keep cell phone and electronics out of sight. If something comes up and an emergency happens and you need to take or make a call, feel free to step out and feel free to take care of personal needs. What will participation look like? How will we know if you are participating today? 
Well, as my slide says, we are looking for you to be focusing on the content that's in front of you. We're looking for you to participate fully in the structures that we have planned. And smiling is always good and talking with the people around you when it's time. And so what will success look like? Well, <laughs> it will look like having you leave here feeling like you know enough about instruction in Wichita Public Schools to get a good start. Knowing this is not the last time you see this, you will have many opportunities to learn and grow with it. But today, we want you to have enough. Wichita Public Schools is the largest school district in Kansas. Approximately 11% of all public students, of all public school students in Kansas, are educated right here in this city. The 2015-2016 statistics show that our enrollment was at 51,133 students, and we are looking forward to, we believe, enrolling more in, even more than that this year. As it states on our district website, the world walks our school hallways. More than 80 different languages are spoken in the homes of our students. We have 34% Caucasian, 34% Latino, 19% African American, 8% multiracial, and 1% Native American, and 4% Asian. We have 4,100 plus teachers that work in our school district in any one of our 54 elementary buildings, our 15 middle schools, and our three K-8 schools, and our 10 high schools. Plus, we have other special programs in our district where you may be working at this year as well. 32,000 plus lunches are served every day in our district. 13,000 plus breakfasts. Breakfasts? That's not a word. <laughs> Breakfast. It can be today. <laughs> and 7 million cartons of milk are purchased each year. Just a little fun fact about our district. So in order to prepare for you to begin to think about your classroom, and to think about the, meeting the diverse needs in our district, we have some important um, documents, as Lisa mentioned, to take a look at that will help structure us for what we value in instruction and what we expect and uh, each one of those 51,000 plus students deserve every single day. So at this time we're going to take a look at our instruction protocol. So in order to meet the diverse needs of our students, our goal is to provide quality instruction pre-K-12. The instructional protocol is a pre-K-12 document and it ensures that every one of our students will receive quality instruction because every single one of them matter and every single one of them are as important as your own children, as your own nieces and nephews, or as your own neighbors that you love. So as we look at the instruction protocol, it is one of our district's key requirements that outlines instructional expectations for us as teachers. This is a tool that we will utilize as a resource as you're planning your lessons for different resources and ways to teach. It also outlines some of the work that has gone on. As you take a look at this and we study it together, you will notice that they are probably not brand new things as you are looking at it. They are, they are familiar, they are research-based strategies that will yield high results for our students, which is what it is all about. So as you take a look at your um, instructional protocol, we're going to take a look at the top half and you're going to look at the lesson design box. So I'd like you to go ahead and read that box and the information inside of it. It should have content literacy objectives as the first bullet. Go ahead and read through those. This is where we will spend our time this morning is looking at that lesson design and talking about the negotiated contract and the required pieces of lesson planning. So that will be important to you as a teacher in our district. As you look at the arrow that moves to the right, we plan with the opening, work time and closing in mind, and then we move to the lesson delivery. So this is like a cycle here. We teach our students in the lesson delivery box. The arrows go up to our review and assessment, checking to make sure our students are understanding the content that we are teaching. If they're not, we go back to the lesson delivery and do some reteaching the arrow going back and forth there from the review to the lesson delivery because as you know as awesome of teachers as we all are sometimes we have to do some reteaching as 
we are looking at our assessments and figure out another way to reach some of our students. So we go back. We could do the review assessment again, and that helps us to prepare and plan. So it is a cycle as we are looking at instruction, from planning to teaching to assessing, going back into that cycle again and again. As we continue, um, you should know that our, our district has a partnership with the United Teachers of Wichita, and this lesson plan framework, this instructional protocol, and the expectations are part of the negotiated agreement. And so, um, I, I, I know that you can read or you would not be sitting where you are, but this is one slide that I'm going to read to you. And I ask you to humor me in that but important enough that you all hear the same message and we go forward from there. Some of the agreement language says that the teacher, as you can see, shall have a written lesson plan framework that addresses content and literacy objectives and district instructional protocol. And so you have just read about some of those things. So the district says that's what we're gonna do, the union says that's what we're gonna do, okay? Um, point B, four examples of, uh, of lesson plan frameworks that are acceptable as to format and content are attached in the agreement in Appendix B. Point C says the teacher shall make his or her written lesson plan framework and other supplemental materials which the teacher is using available to the administrator upon request. Unless part of a plan of assistance, no lesson plan framework will be requested in advance of the day the lesson plan framework is to be implemented. Point D, the administrator requesting the lesson plan framework will provide meaningful and intentional written feedback to the teacher in a timely manner. And point E, the written lesson plan framework will address any requirements by the Kansas Department of Education for schools designated as priority or focus schools. And so, other questions about any of that can be directed to any of us or, and our union friends have a booth right over here, feel free um, at, at any time to, to run questions um, through them and then we will all be on the same page with regard to that. The other document I'm going to ask you to pull out of your folder is the Marzano Learning Map. And it looks like this. We're going to just introduce this to you right now and begin to take a look at it. The Marzano Teacher Evaluation, this is how we are evaluated on the quality instruction that we are providing in our classrooms. We began this work as a district last year, so it is new to us, and so I don't want you to feel overwhelmed and that you have to know all about it today because we are still learning about it in our district. And so we would like to just point out, we worked on um, seven of the elements. We took a small, a small step in beginning to look at these elements. And um, you will continue to get information and learn about what these look like. But the instruction protocol is the planning tool for how, um, how you teach. And then the teacher evaluation learning map is for how you are evaluated on your quality instruction that you're providing for your students. So we want to make connections between these two documents today. We'll continue to do that as we go through the morning. Why lesson plans? Now you have been through teacher ed programs in which you learned all about objectives and goals. And so it can be said that good teachers lesson plan, yeah, that's, that's what we do. Great teachers know why they lesson plan, but really professional teachers of impact can articulate to others why we lesson plan. What are the, what are the reasons? What are the, what are the professional, what's the professional good that comes from having good lesson plans? You probably said something like, you get more done when you know where you're going, right? Um, you have to be able to plan out your, uh, your work with the standards. And so you have to lesson plan so you can be sure that you don't leave anything out. I would like you to take a writing utensil and go back to your instruction protocol, please. And when you look at that, I'd like you to put a box around the lesson design part. That's really where we're going to camp out today, the lesson design. You can see what the components are there. 
We have, um, we, we, we want you to, to understand them and know them pretty well. We'll talk about each one for a little bit this morning. There are really three things that are really, really important. We're going to talk about an opening, which includes your content and literacy objectives. There is um, the work time, and then there's the closing. And so um, with, with all of those things, um, that's kind of where we produce great instruction. That's the beginning of great instruction. And so Gina will begin us with the opening. All right, as you put that box around lesson design, you probably noticed the first bullet is, say it with me, content and literacy objectives. Nice job. So we're going to be thinking, why do we need content and literacy objectives? What is the purpose of those? And why has our district, as well as our union, deemed these as important in our lesson plans? We want content and literacy objectives so that our students understand what they will learn and what they will do to learn it. So repeat after me. So our students understand what they will learn, what they will learn, and what they will do. And what they will do. So it provides a clear direction for both us as the teacher as well as for our students. In fact, if you take a look at the effect sizes and you think about research, an effect size of 1.0 is awesome, right? That's what we would always want. However, that's not always the case. Anything of, um, at a 0.30 and above is considered average and a great effect size. When we look at teacher at student expectations, when our students are specifically told what they are getting ready to learn, the effect size has been shown to have a 1.44 effect size. That is off the charts when we're looking at student learning. It's a very simple, uh, pretty easy strategy to use, and that is why we have chosen it as an important piece to have in all of our lessons. You do have a resource that is a golden rod sheet as some examples of content objectives. Many of you have probably used them in the past. Whether you are a brand new teacher or you are an experienced teacher, you have probably played with them. However, this is an um, important tool to you. You can just keep it with your lesson planning information as some ideas or some examples of what you might want to use. Content and literacy objectives should be stated as you are getting ready to teach to your students and to teach the lesson. If you choose, you may use some visuals, and these are just a couple of examples. There is no one right way to display them if you choose to do that. However, we do need you to state them as you're getting ready to teach your lesson. A couple more facts about content objectives. They support the grade level standard that you're getting ready to teach in your lesson. So it's always important that we begin with our standards. They should be written in terms of what we expect the students to learn, not necessarily the activity that they're doing. And this was a, a bit of a, um, a change for me. So I won't want to say we're getting ready to do a word sort, which might be how we're going to actually process the information. Rather, it will be focused on the standard. Perhaps we are learning how to sort um, different vowel sounds in words. A content objective should be stated simply. So as we read our standards, we know that they are not always stated in student-friendly definition. So we'll want to make sure that they are student-friendly as we um, state them. And we don't want to overwhelm our students with having many, many objectives for the lesson. So one or two is a good rule of thumb to use as you are preparing to teach. We're going to do a very quick lesson on how to write the content objective. Here's how you do it. It is in three easy steps. Number one, you'll select your standard. Two, as you're looking at your standard, you're going to select the verb out of your standard. And three, you will write that objective using the verb, stating what you want the students to understand and learn in student-friendly language. So here we have a standard I'm getting ready to teach. My standard is decode multi-syllable words. So if I'm going to choose my verb, my verb is decode, decode and I'm going to put it in student-friendly student words. It could be your job is to decode multi-syllable words with a long e vowel sound. 
That is just one way to do it. When we talk about literacy objectives, we're thinking about the how. They're going to learn this content objective how? Well, through the literacy processes of read, write, speak, listen. And so we want to be sure that we are giving our students opportunity to use academic language um, using these processes. It is, um, it is really fun to hear a little second grader say multisyllabic words. The, that, that academic term, it, they, it, they can. They can know exactly what we're teaching them. And so the use of academic language is the how. And we, um, we can be sure that we are giving our students opportunities then to learn the content in that regard. You have this tool, I believe it's blue, and it is some kind of generic examples of literacy objectives. These are ones we tend to go to quite often when we are developing work, and you will want to check in your building to see what their approach is to, um, to designing literacy objectives, but, um, but the, what, what we're trying to do is making sure we give our students chances to not just listen, but to read, write, speak, and listen. Gina will take us into work time. All right, so take a look at your lesson design box. You notice that opening was the content literacy objectives. We have that piece gaining attention, and, and those pieces aren't in there. But we are going to move into the, body, into the work time or the body of the lesson. Just to kind of ground us where we're at, we just did the opening, moving into that next part in the next bullet. So we are going to process the body and what that looks like and, and sounds like in our district, just so you have some background knowledge of the work that we've done in our district in the past few years. You will have a, a um, white handout, and it is called Lesson Plan Format. We're going to do some reading. So it won't be Lisa and I talking at you, but it will be you getting the input from the article as we learn about the body of the lesson and what we're going to do with that article. So if you found the article, great. I'd like to tell you the process that we're going to use in order to take a look at this information. We're going to chunk the text out into three different pieces, and we'll tell you what those are here in just a minute. And after you read a, a, the first piece of text, we're going to ask you to turn to your shoulder partner and say something. So as you're reading, you might want to um, underline something that's sticking out to you, um, something that reminds you of some of your past teaching experience. Maybe you can connect to some of the work you've done um, in other districts or in your student teaching experiences. And so um, when you both are done reading, you're going to be able and have a chance to say something to process, process that part of the article and say what's important to you to know and, and remember as you are getting ready to teach our students. Some examples up on the screen are something you might say. You could ask a question of your partner. Maybe you had a question about something and there's something you want to process. And then there are some other examples. Could be a key point for your summary. But if you're like me, you might want to make sure you're annotating that text because I like to do it right as I'm reading so I can remember what I want to say or bring back when it's my turn to talk. All right, let's take a look at what our first chunk of text is. You're going to actually turn to page two because remember we're in the body or the work time. And you will see there in the middle of the page where it says body of the lesson, you're going to begin there. And there's one short paragraph. And then the second paragraph you're going to read. So you're just reading two paragraphs, one short and one a little bit longer, and then you're going to stop where it says after modeling the skills. So if you want to draw a little line there, I'll say that again. Read the, first, the two paragraphs in body of the lesson and stop where it says after modeling the skill it's necessary to provide prompt practice. Stop right there. So if you have taken the time to get in and look at um, that first part of the, the lesson, if we're starting with some new content, Sometimes this is where we will want to start when we get in and do some direct instruction. We talked about input in the article. <coughs> input can be many different things. It can be reading. You are taking input right now. It could be you standing up giving the input information or it could be getting some input from a media source, a video <coughs> media source. Um, I would like you to 
Turn to the back side of your instructional protocol. We haven't looked at this piece yet. And we're going to start to make some connections as we're reading here. As we are looking at the pieces within the work time. At the very top of the back piece where it says, you'll see gradual release of responsibility at the top of the back side of the paper. And that first third of the top of the paper is DQ2. That's design question two. And if Marzano is new to you, the evaluation system is new to you, this is one of the, uh, one of the design questions and there are elements within this that will help us as we determine how to plan our lessons that we're getting ready to deliver. The beautiful thing about this is it's pretty clear. I hope it's clear. <laughs> as you take a look, the red box are the teacher behaviors when we are providing instruction on new content. The blue box is the student desired effects. So as we think about the elements, as we think about what we're getting ready to teach with our content and our standards, we get to choose how we teach that and what the desired, the student desired effects are. So as we are assessing, we're really looking to see if our students are understanding that lesson. And as you just kind of briefly take a look at those student desired effects, they are very much involved in processing the new content. So it's sometimes that gradual release of responsibility you will um, hear as I do it. It's reminding us of the explicit instruction that is sometimes needed with the new content. And it is also important that our students are able to process. So because as you read those student desired effects, that's where we'll um, be evaluated. We'll want to make sure our students are learning, which is what we're all about. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next portion. As we're thinking about our content, we're thinking about what we're getting ready to teach. The we do it part will be that, so we're starting to kind of um, be less guided, starting to move into our students, are starting to take some more ownership, but still with our guidance. So you're going to begin where you left off in your article. There at the bottom of page two, where it starts with after modeling the skill. You'll read that bottom paragraph. You'll turn it over to page three and just read the um, to the end of that paragraph where the last word is discussion in that paragraph. You'll stop where it says the purpose of the check. As we again go to the back side of the instructional protocol, we're going to begin to make connections now to the design question three, which is in the middle of the back of the document. Again, it has the teacher instructional elements on the right-hand side, so the teacher behaviors, as well as the student desired effects, what we're looking for when we're teaching and what we want our students to be able to do. We will continue to work and go deeper on these. Right now, we are just making some initial connections, but we will continue this work. And again, this is not the only exposure you'll get to. So we don't want you to feel overwhelmed. We're just kind of trying to make some connections right now. So let's go ahead and take a look at the very ending piece, which is the, the uh, where we'll begin is on page three with that last paragraph where we ended. We'll begin with the purpose of the check step. And we will just stop when we get to the closing of the lesson. As we take a look at this final piece of getting to where our students are able to do the work on their own is the goal, right, that we are getting towards. We want to make sure that as we are planning that gradual release, we provide the necessary input that is needed for the content that we're getting ready to teach. We provide the necessary processing and practicing opportunities for our students. And we also take the time to plan for those um, pieces that allow our students to go deeper and um, have more rigorous um, assignments that they are asking to truly be, um, to have applied the standards and the learning that we are teaching them. So that gradual release is really important. We don't always want to hold on to the learning, but it is truly, as you take a look, again at that second side of the instructional protocol. It is truly about what our students are able 
to demonstrate what is the student evidence that they have learned. And that is what um, your administrators will be looking for as they are coming in and watching your excellent instruction. They're really going to be looking at that student evidence piece. Consider this gradual release idea expressed in a little different way. Just consider this with me. When we think of instruction, that there's instruction, and there's instruction that works, right? We want the instruction that works. And so what we're going to do is look along the right side of my slide. We're going to do the I do it. And then we're going to engage our students in we do it. And then we're going to go to you do it. Now humor me and repeat those with me. First we're going to go into I do it. And then some we do it. And then you Thank you. Thank you, thank you. We want to show you a non-example. A non-example would be, I do it, you do it. We've left out something kind of important, right? We've left out the guided practice, the we do it. We've left out the opportunity for collaboration with other learners, which bumps up the rigor. If we, if we go from, here's how you do this, kids. Now go do it, we, we miss out on a lot. Neither is it right to say, boys and girls, today you're going to learn da 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 da. Here you go. <laughs> That's not teaching, but that happens in some classrooms, probably not yours. Instead, we come back to our model here. We, we want to do a lot of I do it and modeling when necessary. We want to go to a lot of we do it, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of we do it with feedback. And then we go to you do it. Uh, oh, let me say one more thing about that. I gave you an I do it, we do it, you do it, um, which is a, a nice linear formula. But the truth is, with regard to design questions two, three, and four, um, new knowledge, practicing knowledge, deepening and applying knowledge, you don't always have to start with um, with design question two, the, the, um, the working with new knowledge. You don't have to always start there. When you're doing something that lends itself more to discovery and more to inquiry, it, it's okay to start in other places. One question for you to ask might be, how much background knowledge do they have with this? If you need to be sure to front load a lot of background knowledge, then you're gonna pretty much start with, okay, this is, this is working with new knowledge, design question two. So you, I, I don't want you to go away and say, oh, we have to do two, and then three, and then four. Well, you do sometimes, but you have some work to do in your planning as you decide where to begin. So if you would take, please, the back side of your instruction protocol and lay it side by side with your Marzano learning map, like my slide shows, your next task is to do a little bit of review. And here you are then speaking some academic language. You're going to do a review. Partner one or partner A, if you would explain the gradual release of responsibility as you understand it now, that would be good. Partner two or partner B, if you would add to that and share examples of using it as you understand it, that would be good. In review, which should always be interactive, I could tell you all of this information again. Or I could have you express it with me. I will choose the express it with me way. And so let's remind ourselves about the things that we've learned so far that a lesson plan has to have. We're, we're talking about three things, two of which you've heard about. The three things are your opening, which includes your content and literacy objectives, and your work time. And then the last thing will be the closing. We'll talk about the closing in a minute, but I wanted the perspective. So what are the three parts? The opening, which includes content and literacy, content and literacy objectives, the work, work time, and the closing. thank you. When we talk about the closing, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about a review, as you can see, review of what we've done, and interactive is best, so they're using oral language um, or some kind of language. Sometimes it's an exit ticket that they write. So 
that works just fine. Um, and it's always good to preview what's coming. And you've kind of heard us do that all along this morning. You're going to hear more about this. You're going to see this again. You're going to, you're going to work with this at your buildings. And then independent work if it's appropriate at that time. And so um, now it is indeed your turn to do a little bit of reviewing. You have a document in front of you. It is called something like three threes in a row. And you can see what our directions are for this. We want you to stay right where you are seated and talk to people around you, but ask one person um, one answer to one of the nine boxes. These boxes all help you to review this content. Um, summarize their response and write it down in your box. You're the only one that writes on your paper. Raise your hand if you write on your paper. Yes, all the hands go up. You only write on your paper. That's the rules. Um, and then feel free to talk to somebody else about another question and see if you can get three in a row, hence the name of the strategy. And so, go. Final thought about the closing is the idea, in lesson closing, you have just experienced a lesson closing. As you plan them, you keep in mind this. The learner has to think about what they've learned, okay? The learner has to do that thinking. It is as though it is a bookend to the content in our brains. When we open up content, that's, that's one bookend. Then we have the content, we have to close it with another bookend. Then it is there for easy retrieval in, in future learning situations, and we want that to be so. Considering all that you've learned today, and you have a little hint about all that you're going to learn, what might you want to stay mindful of as you enter into this world of lesson planning? We thank you for your professionalism and your time today. We wish you well. We are here and have a great day.